Welcome to the Princeton Flying School podcast with Pete Rafel, Princeton Flying School Instructor Emeritus. In this episode, Pete invited Colonel John Skip Rawson back to the podcast for a part two interview. Pete and Skip covered a lot of ground in their last interview, but Skip still had plenty of stories to share about the planes he has flown, including the J-3 Cub, T-28A, the Cessna 337, the T-6 Trainer, Lockheed Hudson Bomber, Cessna 170, Stearman Biplane, the B-17, and even the Japanese Replica Zero, which was a reworked T-6. So without any further introduction, let's join part two of the conversation with Pete Rafel and Skip Rawson. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome again to uh, a podcast from Princeton uh, Airport and Princeton Flying School. Um, I'm Pete Rafel, um, former chief pilot here. And today I've invited uh, Skip Rawson back for a second session. We we had a good response from the first podcast that we did with Skip's recollections of his uh, flying. And... Uh, Today we're going to we're going to do some more and reflecting mostly on uh, from a general aviation point of view. Um, Skip has flown so many different types of airplanes that it's hard to sort out the ones I'm going to ask him about. But I thought we would start today with um, his J3 Cub experiences. Um, we all think of the J3 as the iconic Piper Cub, and um, a lot of folks have learned to fly using the Cub, and you did certainly, Skip. I sure did. Um, you ever fly it at night? Yes, I did. Um, we have to remember this was right after World War II, and all these instructors were old Air Force or Army pilots from World War II, and they had a, a program that paid them money from the government. It was called the 4852 Club. They got 48 bucks a week for 52 weeks if they were an ex, ex-Army pilot. Maybe other people qualified for that, I don't know. But the result of that was at Hadley Airport in South Plainfield, there was about eight or 10 of these guys hanging out because they didn't need to work. They had the 48 bucks a week coming in and that seemed to be enough for them. So I had, as a kid, working in the hangar, I had all these guys who took pity on me and would give me free flying lessons, including my hero, Kashmir Xavier Gubernat. He was a P-47 fighter pilot, and he's the guy that soloed me in a, in a J-3, and he's the guy that put his head down, and I already told you that story. <laughs> we had a way of flying at night in a Piper Cub. We had two dry cell batteries that were hooked together, and you put them in an OD Army bag behind the front seat, and you, you, you connected them with alligator clips. And that turned on the red and green wingtip lights and a white light on top of the tail. And you could fly at light. Was that at night? Was that legal? It certainly wouldn't be today. But back then, we just did it. I don't recall ever meeting an FAA guy during my years at Hadley Airport. I'm sure they came around, but I never saw any of them. Anyway, we would take off at night, and Route 130 was our favorite highway. And we would fly down Route 130 at any altitude you wanted, including 200 feet, at night, over the trucks. And I have a clear memory of doing that. It was so exciting. And then come back and land at night with no landing lights. And Hadley had two runways, a grass runway, which was the long one, and a shorter, what they called cinder. I think it was made out of stone and asphalt shavings of some kind. But the grass had a reflective quality to it. So at night, you could see the black runway to land. No landing lights in a Piper Cub. And then, of course, later on a Piper Cub, my son and I, starting when he was about 10, 14 years in a row, we flew a Piper Cub to Oshkosh from Cupper Airport here in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And we flew with Pete Dablowski and his son and two Piper Cubs. We had battery-powered CB radios so we could talk to each other. And we could also talk to the truckers down on Route 80 because we navigated by Route 80. We took Route 80 all the way to Gary, Indiana, 
turn right and go up Lake Michigan and land at Oshkosh. But the, but they're all going faster than you down the highway, right? I mean. They usually were going faster than us. We did 72 mile an hour. That's the cruise speed on a 12-gallon gasoline Piper Cub. And um, one of my proudest moments is my 11 or 12-year-old or 13-year-old son in the front seat fell sound asleep. And we landed at Bloomfield, Pennsylvania. And my landing was so perfect, probably the only one I ever did. It didn't wake him up. So I taxied up to the gas pump, shut it off, quietly got out of the airplane, took that picture. So I have a picture of my son sound asleep at the gas pumps in a Piper Cub. Now, that same trip, no radio, landing at Oshkosh. You guys know what Oshkosh is like. Oh, yeah, you got the yellow or the green dot you've got to land on. You have all of that, but back then you landed in a no radio pattern on a taxiway in front of of 50,000, 60,000 people. And I made the worst landing of my life. I bounced it so high, my son turned around and he said, Dad, he was so embarrassed. (laughs) (laughs) The landing was so bad. (coughs) Excuse me. But I remember Pete Doblowski and his son. We had tents. We'd sleep under the wing of the airplane. It was a great 14 years. And a couple of times we made it all the way back in one day in the Piper Cubs from Oshkosh. Well, how many stops would you have to make uh, for fuel? That's a very good question. We flew, I think, two hours or two and a half hours um, before fuel stops. So you don't get very far. Yeah. And uh, Bloomfield, Pennsylvania was the first stop. And um, Lorraine, Ohio was the second stop. And I remember some of them. And occasionally we got stuck by weather. We met this singer, Freddie Fender, in Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. We got stuck by weather, Pete and I. And uh, we went to a county fair. It was in a tent, and there was Freddie Fender sitting there, and we got to talk with him and, before he performed. So, And he's been a favorite of mine ever since. <laughs> anyway, that was my Piper Cub, and I still own a Piper Cub, and it's here at Princeton. And old man Vitalaro Sr., Frank Vitalaro Sr., painted it in World War II, authentic World War II colors, and his son, Frank Vitalaro Jr., flies it to air shows. But it's an original 46 uh, Piper Cub. And um, it's got a C90 in it, which makes it a little bit better than, it, mm-hmm. than the uh, 65 horsepower. But it's still here. I have a second Piper Cub I own, which is down in Texas. It's, it's at the air show headquarters down there. Everybody flies it. We keep it at annual. It's a 65 Cub. Mm. So we'll never get rid of those. Those are just wonderful old things to fly in. You can open the side, you know, the door's open. Right, yeah. So that's, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. That's great. So you, you're obviously an old tailwheel pilot, which I have great admiration for. I, I, I love tailwheels myself. The, the big move from a, from a cub to a steerman, and I know you've got a lot of experience in steermans, and I, I'm, I'm one of those poor fellows who's never had a ride in a steerman, so... Well, I sold my, I had it here for a few years at Princeton, and I finally sold it. And the reason I sold it is I have two very close friends who are also business partners of mine, both of whom were pilots here at Princeton Airport, both of whom are new pilots here at Princeton Airport. And they wanted to learn how to fly to Stearman, so they went up to Andover, uh, Dr. Darter did, and he got his tailwheel sign-off in a Stearman. A Stearman is a very docile airplane until you try to land it in a crosswind, and then it's not docile at all. It becomes a handful. Over your head on the top wing is 300 pounds of sloshing gasoline. Now, it does have a baffle, but it still moves a little bit. The landing gear is relatively straight down. Mm -hmm. So you have a pendulum. You have an accident waiting to happen if you don't keep it straight on a runway. And I was afraid that my two friends who wanted to buy a third each of that Stearman were going to kill themselves in it. And I just didn't want to have it around here as a, as a nuisance. And I, mm-hmm. and I wasn't using it because, it, you know, it's a hassle to get it out of the hangar with a tug. And all people want to do is a 20, 30-minute ride. You take them up, you roll them upside down and come back and land. So a Stearman is not an airplane you go anywhere in. So I sold that. But uh, flying a Stearman is, uh, is a unique and it's a great experience. You fly it from the back seat. Yep. So when I flew with Dr. Darter, I, he was in the back seat because he'd been signed off. And I'm in the front seat. I don't think I'd ever been in a front seat. And um, it didn't work out too well. I was a little frightened by some of the things that happened with it. It's a, it's a handful. Mm-hmm. But it's a great old airplane. I mean, it'll do anything. Yeah. Roll and snap roll and barrel roll, loop, whatever you want. 
Well, talking about barrel rolls and loops, you, you've had your fair share of air show flying, right? And uh, I know that you were a member of the uh, Tora 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 group, and those were T6s, I they believe, were that were... Highly modified T6s. The, uh, I flew two of them, two different ones. I flew the Japanese replica Kate, three-passenger. It's a T6, started out in life. The motor had been moved 18 inches further forward, and they put a seven-foot plug in the middle to lengthen the fuselage. Nobody knows where they got the plug from. The MGM movie people made 35 of these airplanes for the original Tora Tora movie, and I got to own the Japanese replica Kate. I also flew the Japanese Zero, also highly modified, shortened a little bit, Oh, both of these airplanes had BT-13 tails, so the tail had been changed to look more like a Japanese silhouette. So it's smaller. Right, it's a smaller tail. The Kate that I flew, three passengers, the first couple of years we carried a guy behind me and a gunner in the back who faced backwards. Uh -huh. And we had the guns. We had fake guns, but we had the guns in the back. When the FAA got involved, they wouldn't let us fly anybody but ourselves, so the guns disappeared and... The, we kept the center cockpit closed with bungee cords because you could only have a central crew. That was what the FAA did to us. We used to even have a dummy after we landed. We would take the dummy and put it over the side of the middle cockpit so it looked like a wounded guy, you know, hanging out. <laughs> um, it's very interesting. I did that for 31 years, and we had quite a few adventures along the way. One that stick, two that stick in my mind. The first one was at Geneseo, New York. When I landed after we bombed that place, you know, we have a lot of pyrotechnics. There's a lot of explosions. We get shot down by a P-40, fake shot down, and we turn on smoke. As I'm taxiing in, there was a guy sitting in a chair, a big old guy, and he gave me a thumbs down as I taxied by. And I didn't like that. I, for some reason, he was identifying. He turns out that he was a Pearl Harbor survivor. And he remembers, we talked to him later, he remembers seeing the face of a Japanese pilot as they were strafing the, the breakfast hall, and he remembers seeing it. After that air show, I carried a small American flag in a nav box on the right-hand side, and when I taxied in, I would hold up the American flag out of the cockpit, so I didn't get another thumbs down like I did from that old guy. I didn't yeah. like that. Yeah, that's much. worse than being graded uh, a number three, like a diving uh, That's right, <laughs> it would be worse than that. The, um, the other memory of uh, flying those things I mean, there were so many different things that happened to us. But um, we had a B-17 in our routine. Now, there's eight of us flying, and, they, and we do head-ons. In other words, one Japanese Kate will be coming down the runway towards me, and I'll be going towards him. We're both doing 180 to 200 miles an hour because it's the end of our dive. So it's a 400-mile-an-hour closure. It happens very, very quick. The B-17... We would call, our leader would call the B-17's base leg, and that B-17 would turn final, and he would go through the, the middle of our show. We always flew with the same crew, and they knew exactly how to do it and exactly where to be. We got a new B-17 one time down in Texas at Ellington Field, Houston, and I was watching these guys at the briefing. We're all standing in a big circle outside of Jap Zero, and I watched them. I didn't know who they were. And after the briefing was over, I went over to him and I said, you know, this other Kate and me, we're going to have a head-on to your routine, to you coming through, and the other guy's going to have a tail chase. It's critical that you stay at 100 feet, 100 miles an hour, and go a mile off the end of the runway and don't pull up. Just keep going. Don't pull up. He said, no problem, no problem. So we went up and we did our routine. And... Charles, the leader, calls the base leg for the 17. He comes down final, and I'm just coming off my perch. I'm at stall speed at the top and straight down, getting my 200 mile an hour, 180 mile an hour. And I hit the flat, and here comes the B-17 at me. And behind him is my buddy John Story. He's coming down, getting his 200 mile an hour behind him. And we're both heading at each other at 400 miles an hour with a B-17 in the middle. Right in the middle of Air Show Center, the B-17 pulls up. He could have killed us both. Story made a split-second decision to go under him, and I made a split-second decision to go above him. Just luck that we did that. 
because the story's on one side of the runway and I'm on the other side and the B-17's in the middle. There's no room. He has to stay at 100 feet and he didn't. He pulled up. Somebody actually got that photograph. And uh, we, the story was so angry, he wanted to go over and accost the guy after we landed and I wouldn't let him. But Charles, our leader, said he'll never fly with us again. He disobeyed a safety rule like that. He could have mm -hmm. been horrible. I mean, we could have hit the B-17 with how many guys in it. You know, you don't know. Anyway, that was the second thing I wanted to tell you. The 31 years flying with a group of guys, all going across country. I mean, we flew in most states in America, and, and we prided ourselves on never making a radio call except to each other. And I clearly remember flying from San Diego after we did an air show to Norfolk, Virginia, and we never talked to flight service. We never talked to anybody but Unicom and, our, and each other. We just planned a trip that way. And it was really marvelous not to have to do that. My aircraft was involved in an incident, which I just remembered, at Norfolk. Pouring rain, Friday night, we're all in the officers' club. Somebody asked me some question about my airplane. I had to go get my books. So I got in the car they loaned us, and I drove over to my airplane in the pouring rain to see all kinds of emergency equipment around my airplane. A man in the pouring rain had run across the ramp and hit the wing of my airplane and knocked himself out. The FAA was there, along with first responders and all those guys, and the FAA man's name was George Bush, same as the president. <laughs> and he said to me, is that your airplane? I said, yeah, I own this airplane. He said, we have to write it up. I said, why? He said, it's involved in an incident. I said, it's tied to the ground. It doesn't matter. It's involved in an incident. So it did get written up for that. So just My goodness. be careful. <laughs> he, he survived, I, I assume. And I don't know what happened to him. Yeah. They carted him away in an ambulance and... Could, could you do that same cross-country today without talking to I think anybody? You, I think you might be able to. I pride myself on going around the cakes or getting underneath them and uh, not having to talk to anybody. Although when coming back up from Mississippi, where I go often, I do like flight following, especially yeah. at night when I'm coming through the Philadelphia area into here yeah. because there's so much traffic. Those guys can keep you out of trouble. But other than that, I don't do flight following. My, my other most recent trips are always up to the St. Lawrence River, uh, Watertown, New York, and I just get out of the cake and go turn north and go. I, actually, from here, you can go straight there. You, you're not in anybody's airspace. Yeah, but you're over the Adirondacks, and you're not talking to anybody then, right? No, I never talk to anybody. Yeah. Of course, the Poconos is always kind of bad weather sometimes. When it's nice here, the Poconos sometimes are a little misty. Yeah. Is that yeah. the right word? Well, as, as an old flight instructor, I, I would like to caution our audience to Get fight following whenever you can. <laughs> if you have the number of hours that Skip has, well, we'll talk about it. But <laughs> so, so you didn't hear about the three three seven gear up landing either. No, I didn't. I didn't. I couldn't imagine that you have a mishap ever. But go ahead, tell me about three three seven is a is a Cessna uh, push me pull you. The, the, right, it's a twin the, engine. The twin engine. Motor one. in the front, motor in the back. Yeah, And I was flying with a man who's a very good friend of mine who will remain unnamed because of his history. He was a, a down-and-out drug-addicted person and also an alcoholic, and he had cured himself of all of that. But people who have gone through that sometimes are a little bit different. And when you talk with him, he's either a half a second ahead of you or a half a second behind you. You have to learn how to, to do that. It's very just mm -hmm. the first time you get involved in that. But he's a great guy. And he and I were in a push-pull going to Watertown, New York. And I had it full of gas. I had the long-range tanks. We get, and it's in February. I get up to Watertown, New York, where it can be very cold and it's always snow-covered. And the gear won't come down. We put the gear down. It came out 18 inches and froze there. We had aboard the airplane um, one bottle of water and 12 chocolate donuts. And the only tool we had was a Leatherman that my friend had in his pocket. The gear froze at 18 inches out of the gear wells. It wouldn't go down, it wouldn't come back up, it froze. The FAA actually showed me what happened a couple of months later to the gear. Just, just, just to clarify, the, the main gear, they fold back like a RG does, a regular That's correct, sensor? but it twists as it folds right, back. Right, okay. And a, and a twisting motor, the way that works is what did this to to us. In any event, um, we got on the radio to the Unicom, and Unicom called a O2 mechanic from Vietnam with Vietnam experience. He lived in Pennsylvania. 
a great guy, Ken Williamson. So they got him on the telephone and patched him up to me. And uh, he had me try all kinds of things, including getting up to 5,000 feet, feathering the front engine, and then doing a parabolic uh, maneuver where you go to zero G and shut the rear engine off. Okay, so now you have no engine. I, uh, pardon me, you don't shut the rear engine off. You do the weightlessness. No one told me that when you do that, sometimes, occasionally, the fuel injection system has a leather or some kind of a plastic float in it. We'll go to the top of the canister and shut the gas off, and that's what happens. So here you are, front engine is feathered, and you're doing a zero-G deal, and that's when you're supposed to try to get the gear down again to unload it somehow. Didn't work. I got both engines started up, no problem. I didn't know that the local television station was monitoring the Unicom frequency, so they heard all the back and forth between me and the mechanic in Pennsylvania. Make a long story short, we flew for about four and a half hours to burn out all the gasoline. We have to land, we can't land on the grass, certainly not going to put it in the snow. We're going to land on a concrete runway. And I was always afraid of fire with that kind of a landing. I never, it's the only time I ever did it. And I was a little afraid of the guy in the co-pilot seat because of, because of his history. And I told him, I said, I want you to put your hand against the instrument panel, but don't lock your elbow, keep it poised. I wanted to give him something to do. And I said, on final approach, I'm going to shut down both engines. I'm going to feather both of them. So I want you to open the door about two inches. And then when the airplane stops, I want you to run off the wing, underneath the wing, right into the snow. Got that? Got that. So I shut both engines down. Meanwhile, on the ground at a fire department, the guys are in their asbestos suits, but also the local TV station had dispatched two women, both of whom wanted to be noticed. They were in their short skirt outfits and high heel shoes. It's freezing cold up there, and these two gals were freezing. But one of them had the camera, and the other one had the microphone, and they were off to the side. I made the landing, which was okay. We survived it. My friend opened the door, and he ran out, but he didn't take off his earphones. He forgot. So as he ran out of the airplane, I ran right into him. Bam! And I was caught on live TV, unfortunately. <laughs> we got out of the airplane. There was no fire. There was no anything. It was just fine. And the woman comes up to me and asks me a question. She said, how does it feel to be the pilot of something like that? I said, oh, I didn't fly it. He did. And I pointed to the other guy. She went over to him, live TV, and she said, how did it feel to make that landing? He said, Leatherman sucks. Chocolate donut, good. <laughs> and that went out. At the annual dinner that year, we gave him a plaque that had a chocolate donut on it and a Leatherman and his comment that went out. It was very funny. They found us later that morning at a diner while I was waiting for Jimmy Hyder. Jimmy Hyder from here flew up to bring us home. Uh -huh. And uh, they found us at the diner, and they came in and interviewed us again at the diner. Not much news in Watertown, New York in February, no. so we were big news. And um, the FAA started to tell you, there are four pins, four dowels that rotate that gear. A motor turns them. And over the years, they've discovered that those dowels break. And the FAA guy said, you were probably down to one dowel that would have turned it, but it broke. So the gear won't rotate, and if it won't rotate, it can't move. Mm -hmm. So it was stuck outside of the gear doors, but it wouldn't go down, it wouldn't come up. So you're lucky you had fairly decent weather. We had good weather, yes. Cold, but good weather. Yeah. We were lucky, yeah. Leatherman sucks. <laughs> and a box of... 12 chocolate donuts. I, we, we consumed everything. <laughs> we pulled up the carpet, and he took his leather man, and he undid all the inspection plates, and we had a fire extinguisher aboard, and I had him pounding on the gear with the fire extinguisher to see if we could unlock it somehow. None of that worked. Mm. So we were just stuck to sit up there and burn out the gas. You... Um you told me about... You, you, had a, you lost an engine in the pattern in a 170... Uh, yes, coming back from Oshkosh um, at Cupper, I was in the pattern, and we just lost a cylinder. And you could tell something's wrong because it was a six-cylinder, you know, those beautiful motors, and it just starts to vibrate a little bit. And I knew something was wrong, but it didn't stop the motor or anything. I made the landing, and you go pull a prop through, and you have compression on every cylinder except one. 
So the cylinder, the cylinder broke. Did the piston come out of the? I think I think it burned a hole in it, or it froze the valve. I'm not sure exactly what happened. I don't remember that. That's mm -hmm. happened to me twice. And um, the L6, the one you flew, uh, it happened here as well. And uh, the same thing. I think it just burned a hole in the in the head of the piston. Yeah. Something gave way. It stopped compression. So you lose the power from that, and that makes the motor vibrate a little bit. Yeah, I saw an S2 that had the T28, the right. you know the 1820, um, where the where one of the outboard cylinders, the actual cylinder broke away from the body of the engine, right, and punched a hole. Actually, took that part of the the outboard nacelle away, and the piston just kept going right. in and out. Right. It was a rough runner, but he kept it running. Right, right. And when they landed. It looked like uh, just a large metal ball on the end of a of its of you know <laughs> of the connecting rod or right. the, whatever you call it, and it had just gone boom 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 boom, boom right, right. and had just ball peen the entire engine on that side because it was outboard. He never saw it, but the entire airplane was covered with oil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, did I tell you last time I was a T twenty eight when I lost the motor in a T twenty eight? No, <clears throat> I don't I think tell. I did. We were in uh, pilot training, and um, I lost a motor at, right at IP. Now, at IP, you're a student, you're a hot shot, you're top gun, you're all that baloney, and you try to hit the IP, the IP as fast as you can go. Initial point for your approach into yeah, the airport, 45 right? degrees right. off the uh, 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 final approach, right. 45 degrees. As fast as that thing would go was 280 knots. I remember the number. And you hit the IP and you turn to the runway. When you get over the numbers, you go to idle. It's a yes. wonder we didn't kill all those motors. You go to idle, 4G left turn. The minute you go uh, Into the break. downwind, wings level, gear down. The minute the gear locks down, turn to the fi turn final and land. It's a circular approach and you land. I am at the IP when it blew a piston. At home someplace, I have the piston. They gave it to me. They made an ashtray out of it and I have it. I don't know where the hell it is, but I have it. <laughs> anyway, I hit the IP, and bam, it went, and the whole thing started to shake like mad, and I began to get oil on the front windscreen. You always land with the canopy open, and the A model T28, that's a safety precaution. You lock it open. So it was open. At the end of the runway off to a side is a mobile control tower with a couple of instructors in it. They heard it go. So they scrambled the fire engines as I'm making the pattern, and I land... No problem. I mean, the whole thing worked. I didn't need the power anymore. You go to idle anyways. And I went through the high-speed turnoff and stopped. The fire engines come running up, and the fire chief gets out. Here's how cool I was, baby. He looks up at me. I'm sitting on the wing. I'm sitting over 90 gallons of gasoline, and he says to me, it's Lieutenant, may I have that cigarette, please? <laughs> Not my finest. Did moment. you make a student of the week that? that I way? think I did. I don't, I don't remember, but that was my. I love the T twenty eight. I mean, it's a marvelous airplane. But that was the A model, right? The A the model to get engine. it to. We had a four hundred mile an hour club. They kept telling us not to do it, so we all had to do it straight down. Straight it? down, both feet on the left <laughs> rudder. Now maybe some of your students wouldn't understand why you had to put both feet on the left rudder, because wow. the, the rudder itself is is one degree offset in the back. Uh, and at 400 miles an hour, that sucker just wants a wing off to one side. So yeah. it takes two feet to hold that rudder pedal. It's so, so tough to push at that point. 10,000 feet, roll it upside down, wide open, straight down, and you can do 367 knots, which is 400 miles an hour. Now, there was no formal training for this, so that's no, your fellow just, cadets told you what to do on that, right? Right. The ones right. who had survived this. Right. Yeah. And we were near Sykeston, Missouri, <laughs> and we did kill a couple of guys, too, by the way. But anyway, at Sykeston, Missouri, there's a bridge. And every day they would say to us, nobody fly under that Sykeston Bridge. And, of course, we all had to do it then, right? Right. And we all did. And I lament that I didn't do it inverted. I remember going under it. But I should have done it, and I didn't. But, that would have been oh, another well. opportunity to be student of the week. Uh, yeah, another opportunity, <laughs> right, right, right. A lot of funny things happened. But. You, just before we go today, you, you did mention flying a, an airplane, uh, which I have only seen in photographs. I've never seen a Hudson, actually. I've never flown in the Hudson. And, uh, but I, I know that they were very active um, 
in the Aleutians, and uh, I believe the British flew the British them too. British had them, yeah, anti-submarines, right. So you flew air show? I flew it in air shows, and I flew it for seven years for the Confederates, and it was a marvelous airplane. It's 1,200 horsepower on each side, mm. and it's very fast. It'll outrun a B-25. I mean, I've raced B-25s, in it, and it'll outrun a B-25. It's a great big old tail dragger. It's a tail dragger, but you got an awful lot of power, uh, 1,200 on each side. And um, I really didn't have any incidents in it except my check ride when I got typed by the FAA. The FAA designee was an old, old Lockheed pilot, and he wanted to have me turn into a feathered engine. I don't like turning into a feathered engine. You really mm -hmm. don't want to do that. But he had me turn into a feathered engine, and I didn't like it. Then he had me turn into a feathered engine and approach to a stall. Ooh. I really didn't like that. The Hudson bomber it has to be at 8,000 feet. If you turn it upside down to recover, you need 8,000 feet to recover that thing. We were at 5,000 or so. And I'm turning into a dead engine to approach to a stall, and I recovered quickly. He said, that's not the way to do it. Let me show you. And he started to do it, and the airplane started to buck. I took it away from him. I'm in a pilot seat, and he's the designee. I just pushed down on the control column. I wasn't going to die for his stupidity, and uh, he never said a word to me about it, but I took it away. Yeah. He made me make a landing at Harrisburg National Airport with no flaps and no brakes, a hydraulic failure landing. You can't do that. It'll run right off the end of the runway. You have to have brakes, and you have to land slow with flaps with that thing. It's a heavy airplane. It's 18,000 pounds, I think. Wow. So he had me do that. No brakes, no brakes. He's telling me we're heading toward the end of the runway. I put the brakes on. He never said a word, and he passed me, of course. And then I flew it for seven years for the Confederate Air Force, wow. right up to the time they made me change the name from Confederate Air Force to Commemorative Air Force. Had to have a C in the name because all the air, all hundred airplanes had a C A F on a tail. I understand the reason for the change is because one of the major supporters of the organization wanted to change. It had nothing to do with... The, the, um, uh, there was an oil company, a Texas oil company, that gave us a million dollars worth of oil every year. Right. And the woman who ran the program called the headquarters, and I just happened to be there. I was flying for... I was co-pilot on a B-24, I think, that time. But anyway, she said, we can't give you the oil next year because you're called Confederate Air Force. It took them five seconds to change their name to... Commemorative. Yeah, because oil is so expensive. And we, had to, we had to keep the C yep. on, the, on the tails. Right, right. But the Lockheed, uh, you know it as a Lockheed Lodestar. Right. And they took four of them and made Howards out of them. Oh. The Howard Executive Transport, which is one hell of an airplane. Yeah. You know, they had 2,000 horsepower on each side, and four-bladed props, and just a great old airplane. But nobody mm -hmm. can afford the gas. Yeah. 100 gallons an hour, good luck. <laughs> Boy, there, there, that was a quick 40 minutes or so. Was that so, 40 minutes? <laughs> almost. And I, I want to thank you again for joining me today. This is terrific. And uh, who knows, we might get a number three eventually out of this thing. Well, you haven't heard about Uncle Willie Bob and Tor, 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 so that would be worth a whole goddamn... We'll do that another day. 40 minutes. Thank you, Skip. I really appreciate your... You're quite welcome. Enjoy I enjoy again. doing it. <laughs> and I hope all of you out there enjoyed listening to Skip uh, t tell these stories and... Uh, these adventures and um, join us again next time. Take care. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Princeton Flying School podcast with Pete Rafel. Our podcasts are recorded at the Princeton Airport and are produced by HG Media. If you enjoyed our show, please share it with your friends. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts.